Amen. Yeah, I believe we've been under siege for far too long. Pastor was right in saying so. So if you would please turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 22. I'm going to read one verse out of Ezekiel chapter number 22. That verse will be verse number 25. I'm going to set the stage tonight uh, with two uh, books of the Bible that are you would think are polar opposites but are not. To continue my lesson on the seven heads of Antichrist, this is going to be the second part. I briefly went over Egypt and Assyria in the first part of this, and before that I had the spirit of Babylon and why Babel. And these things are all leading to show us that the world is moving in a direction that with everything we see with the coronavirus and the world with the financial system and and the, what, what they're predicting as far as food shortages and whatnot, we can see these things starting to take place more now than ever before. Amen. Pastor's right. I think we were very complacent in America for far too long as far as this goes. I would love to see a revival at Brigham Baptist Church, but more I'd love to see a revival in America where the American people got back and serve God the way we should. America is a Christian nation founded on the Bible. Uh, the Bible is throughout everything that we as a nation stand for. Almost every law is based somewhere in the Bible. But that being said, we'll begin our study tonight, Seven Heads of the Antichrist, the second part of this, uh, chapter 22 of Ezekiel, verse number 25. The Bible reads, There is a conspiracy of our prophets in the midst thereof like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Keep this on your mind tonight. Conspiracies are throughout the entire Bible. Throughout the entire Bible. Jesus going to the cross, they had to try him at night, conspire uh, with Pilate to put Jesus on the cross. So conspiracies are nothing new. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, though. 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter, Peter 5, verse number 3. The Bible reads, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Pastor said it starts with him. He's right. Then it trickles down to me and then the rest of you. We need to be examples to each other. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, that's Jesus Christ, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Amen. But we have a job to do right now. Verse 5, though, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour." whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of grace, who hath called us unto, etern unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask tonight that it would be your words and not mine, that your Holy Spirit would move and that we would be able to learn some, some really in-depth Bible tonight, that we would be strong, that we would be settled, unmoved, and established in our faith tonight, Lord. I ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, I don't know if there are any detectives in here tonight, but the third head of the Antichrist I'm going to be talking about is a lion. The lion. And I'm going to go more in depth, but I wanted to read those two verses because what you need to understand tonight is that the devil is like a lion. The Bible doesn't say he is a lion. He's 
like a lion. And I'm going to show this tonight, how important it is that we use the Bible to back up what we believe. And there are a lot of books out there. There are a lot of, a lot of pamphlets, movies, DVDs that have got people really confused on what this seven heads of Antichrist really is. You know, they've got everything from from England being the lion all the way down to all these other countries. They've got it twisted here and there. They've got it so messed up. They, they got America being the wings of the eagle that gets plucked out because we came from England. They've confused so many people for so long. Why? Because there's a conspiracy. Ezekiel 22, 25, I just read it. Among the prophets. There's a conspiracy. Why? Because they're greedy, greedy of filthy lucre. Hey, and don't be surprised because there are certain men crept in unawares before of old, ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be surprised there's a conspiracy out there tonight to deceive you on prophecy and deceive you in, your, in God's word. Don't be surprised. We have to notice, number one, there's a few things I just jotted down. Number one, it's a head of a lion. I noticed that a lion's a predator. A lion is the king of the jungle, right? I mean, we all know that. Uh, the lion sleeps tonight, the king of the, whatever that song is. But they, they are always a symbol of power. Lions are always a symbol of power. I like when you drive by some of the wealthier parts of, of town and you drive by a really big house and they've got two lions, and then the neighbor's got a bigger house and he doesn't have any lions. So who's the one in power? I don't know. I just find it quite amusing that we look at things like this and we think, you know, the lion symbolizes great strength and power. And it's true. So let's turn back to Rev Revelation 17 briefly. Just briefly, because I need to lay this foundation quickly because uh, we're short on time, unless you want me to go go in until about 8, 830. Um, so I'm going <laughs> to preach it. Yeah. Um, this could turn into one of those uh, long studies if I let it, but I'm going to try to just briefly go over Revelation 17 again because I need to lay this foundation because I want the Bible to speak to you. See, there's not a conspiracy in this book and there's no contradictions. There's none. Things that look like they could be confusing really are not, and they're explained if you use the scripture to interpret the scripture. See, we have to be able to use spiritual things to discern spiritual things. So in Revelation 17, I'm, for the sake of time, I'm just going to paraphrase verse 7. The angel says, why are you confused or marvel? But starting in verse 8, he's marveling about the, the great whore of Babylon and the beast that carries her. Verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and ascended out of the bottomless pit, and goeth into perdition. And they <clears throat> go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. Now we know what this is, right? We know that the Antichrist is going to be shot and killed. It's going to be a death. It's not going to be a fake death. Believe it or not, there are people out there that say, oh, he got a deadly wound to the head and he lived. That's part of the deception. Let me tell you something. People aren't going to believe a fake death. They need to see it with their eyes. Someone like JFK lose all their gray matter out of the back of their head, right? On the back of the car. They need to see that in order to fall for it. Why? Because Jesus, in given a prayer phrase in Luke chapter 16 about Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom, he had to say, look, even if one comes back from the dead, you probably won't believe it, right? You probably won't believe it. You guys, seeing is believing, right? So people are always looking for something. Now, let's continue on. Whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Now see, here's a key because the people that are going to fall for this are the people whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. Okay? So what does that mean? That means that they were deceived. Okay? They're going to be deceived. They are deceived. And God is going to send a strong delusion. Why? Because they believe not the truth that they might be saved. And when you're saved, you're in the Lamb's book of life, right? Right? Now, verse number nine, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains 
on which the woman sitteth. Those seven mountains are the seven kingdoms. We learned that last time. Seven mountains. A mountain is a kingdom when referenced in the Bible. Jesus is going to rule the earth with his mountain. His kingdom will cover the entire earth, right? That's what the Bible says. Verse number 10, and there are seven kings. How do we know a mountain's a kingdom? Because kings rule over a kingdom. So there's seven kings that rule over seven mountains. Okay? Now, that being said, five are fallen. So when John is looking down the corridor of time, he sees that there are five kings that have already died. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, the Medo-Persians, and the Grecians, which were led by Alexander the Great. And, the, and, and one is... Rome or the Roman Empire is the one that's during this time still in control. And the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue for a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Now, three times we notice that the beast dies. The beast dies. Right? So I don't think it could be any more crystal clear that the Antichrist is going to die and come back from the dead. I don't think that we should be even in this debate whether or not it, that's part of the great deception. No, he's going to die. He's going to come back from the dead. There's 20 other verses I could use to back that up. But most of us in here tonight, I would believe, agree that the Antichrist is going to take a deadly wound to the head and he's going to come back. That being said, turn to Revelation 13. Revelation 13, because all these things are really important as we lay the foundation for who the lion is and what it represents and what kind of leader this Antichrist is going to be. Because when we look at Egypt, we saw that Pharaoh was a very, very prideful leader, but he also controlled the food. Did he not? He controlled the food. Jacob had to go down into Egypt to buy corn. Joseph had to set aside uh, seven years food for the seven years of famine. So we know that the king of Egypt was in control of the food. So that's the first head of the Antichrist that we went over is the Egyptian head. Now, the Bible doesn't give him a beast name like the lion, the bear, or the leopard. But we know this because we can look at the history of the Bible and say, Pharaoh controlled the food. And in controlling the food, he controlled the people, right? Now, we know the second world empire because of the Bible. We don't even need a history book. This is the best history book we can use. We know that Assyria and the Assyrians were the ones that ruled the world next. And the Assyrians, when we look at them, they could, they could tort, they were very violent. In the book of Nahum, um, Nahum calls them the bloody city. They could skin a human being alive just to the point to where they would stay alive longer and then bleed to death and die. They were very gruesome. They were very morbid. But we can see that head of the Antichrist too. Why? Because he's going to cause all to receive his mark or they're going to be put to death. He's going to be a very violent person. He's going to be a very violent ruler. He's going to rule with this absolute authority with violence, just like the Assyrians. And the other thing about the Assyrians that a lot of people don't know, they used to build these really big walls around their cities because they thought that they were, you couldn't penetrate the walls. But guess what? They obviously fell apart. And if you look at their walls today, they're about two foot tall, right? And that ought to be a lesson to all the world militaries today. Just when you think you're at your height, just when you think you're the strongest, guess what? There's always somebody stronger. There's always a bigger brother. There's always someone who can whip you. You know, just when the American Olympic team thought that they were always the fastest, nobody was ever going to beat them, and they had the track, they had the field, along comes Usain Bolt, right? Just when you think you're the best of the best, out of nowhere comes someone to beat you. Right? And when we think of the Babylon and we think of the way that it brags, we and, and it sits there and says, I am alone. I, ha I, I, ha I have no need. I am, a, I am no widow. Nobody can touch me. And that's the arrogance of many of the world powers today. They don't think anybody can touch them. Do, is that true? Because many of them have nuclear weapons, right? 
Now, as long as they have nuclear weapons, it doesn't make sense for us to invade someone or for them to invade us. So there are many people or many nations that, that could fall under this uh, Babylonian spirit. But that's not really what I'm trying to get to tonight. I want to focus on what these seven heads are. They represent, as, as one person, there are seven representing one. What does that mean? Well, I would call it the seven characteristics of the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist has the characteristics of every one of the worst rulers to ever rule the world. He's the worst of the worst. I'm going to prove that to you tonight. Revelation 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his, ten, his horns ten crowns. And upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. First thing I want to talk to tonight is a lion-like leader. A lion-like leader. Because of what time it is, that may be the only point I get. Unless I write this down in a book. Now... <laughs> But here's the thing. The Antichrist is a lion-like leader. See, I don't believe John, when he's standing there, really actually sees a beast come out with seven weird heads. What I see is him under the Holy Spirit, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, being able to look at this guy come out of the sea and him see this guy and see him through the corridor of time and him able to compare what he knows already in the book of Daniel what he's able to compare under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is this guy is like a lion but the funny thing about this is he has a mouth as the mouth of a lion now hold your place here um, hold your place here and I'd like to go to Daniel chapter number seven because I'm going to back this up tonight and while you're turning to Daniel chapter number seven I'm going to read something to you real quick. How many knew that a lion's roar could be heard five miles away? Five miles away. Did you also realize that it has the largest roar of all the big cats? It's so loud that the roar can reach 114 decibels, which means everybody in here would hear it, including those that struggle with hearing. Everyone would be able to hear a lion roar. I found that really interesting that the Apostle John did not go to college. The Apostle John never sat in middle school. The Apostle John, he probably, I'm not sure he even ran into a lion. So he's comparing this and he's saying under the inspiration of God, he has a mouth like the mouth of a lion. Well, let's see what that would look like. The mouth of a lion. Now, in order for me to lay this foundation, I'm going to go backwards, showing you the interpretation in one verse to go back to verse number four. Now, in verse number 17, just bear with me, verse 17, this is Daniel giving the interpretation, okay? Keep this in mind. Daniel's giving the interpretation, and he's given the interpretation after the dream, Okay, so verse 17, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings. So we know that these are four kings. This is not England. This is not Russia with some coalition with bones hanging out of its mouth. This is not leopard with Germany. These are, those are all guys that are trying to sell you a $100 DVD set. Those are from guys trying to sell you their book club. Those are from guys who actually I'm concerned about many of their salvation, and I'll tell you why. Because if you're saved and you have the Holy Spirit of God, you should be praying and asking God to help you discern this. You just don't jump in and start saying this is this and this is this and that is that. you got to make sure you're able to back it up with the Bible. Because if you can't, I really don't want to hear it. I really don't. I'm sick of it. And uh, there, I said that again. Verse number four. I would, actually, somebody said, you know, you always say you're sick of it. Well, that's my way of being nice, just saying I'm sick of it. Because I'd really like to kick and slap the pulpit, but I'm going to try to refrain from that tonight. 
So knowing that these are four kings, guess what? They arise out of the earth. They arise out of the earth. But wait a minute, in Revelation 13 it says, he saw him come out of the sea. Well, if you were here for the other lessons, the waters, the sea, that's the earth, that's the nations. Those are the kingdoms of the world. So let's go to verse number three of the same chapter. And four great beasts or kings came up from the sea or earth, right? There's a distinct difference. But the sea represents nations, kingdoms, and tongues. We learn that in Revelation 17. If you don't remember that, it's in verse number 1 and 2, and I believe it's verse 16 and 17. We may get back there to check that. But the, this is them coming out of the earth. Now, here's the thing. At this point in history, they're diverse one from the other. They're different. Why? Because they're different kings. But John saw one king. These are different kings at this time. But coming out of the earth, coming out of the sea, they're one king in Revelation. Also, this one's the last one mentioned. He starts with the leopard the bear and the lion in Revelation, but now he's, Daniel's going from the beginning. Okay, and I think there, there's a really good reason why. All right, verse number four. The first was like a lion. Doesn't mean he is a lion. See, there's only one lion in the entire Bible who's actually the real lion, and that's the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's Jesus Christ. He's the only one that really is able to bear the authority and power and strength of an actual lion. This guy, Nebuchadnezzar, is like a lion. And the Antichrist has a mouth like a lion. But he's not a lion. He's not strong. You know, matter of fact, when we stand in heaven and we see the devil, we're going to look at him and say, is this the man that caused the earth to tremble and shake? This guy? We're going to be shocked. Now, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and, as a, and a man's heart was given to it. Now, that does not mean that England was set aside over here and that we came out of England and our because our national emblem's the eagle, and then our eagle's wings were plucked out of the back of the lion, and then the lion stood up on his feet, and that's Uncle Sam. I mean, I've actually heard this. I've actually seen it in prophecy videos. One of them is Erwin Baxter. How many know who this guy is? Erwin Baxter? He had a big popular show for many years. He's teaching this. But now wait a minute, is that what the Bible actually says concerning this? Hold your place in Daniel 7 and turn to Daniel chapter number 4. Daniel chapter number 4. Yes, 4. Daniel 4. Now see, King Nebuchadnezzar is the lion at this time. And starting in verse number 13, for the sake of time, we're going to start our reading. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said, Thus hew down the tree and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit, lest the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. This is important. Let his heart be changed from a man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. Now that's Nebuchadnezzar having the dream. And that would be a very hard dream to interpret, would it not? 
Luckily for us, knowledge has been increased and we have the entire Bible. Daniel chapter 12, one of the most misquoted verses of all time, is men will travel to and fro and knowledge will be increased. And a lot of times people think that that has something to do with education outside of the Bible. But the truth is, knowledge has been increased. We have all 66 books now. And we're able to look through the corridor of time, starting in Genesis, ending in Revelation, going to Revelation and going back to Genesis. We have all the knowledge we're ever going to need. You don't need the extracurricular activities from other books. Those things will usually stir you in a wrong direction because somebody wants to put a cool cover on, the, on their book and label it with a really neat title and confuse you. That's usually what happens. Now, what does this mean? First off... If we use the Bible, the book of Jude says twice dead plucked up by the roots. What's that mean? That means that when somebody's dead and they're spiritually dead, they're going to be plucked up by the roots. But this king is not going to die. He's not plucked up by the roots. And we luckily have the book of Jude to enforce that. And actually it goes on to say, and with a band of iron and brass. Now, let's look at the interpretation of this dream. Scoot down to verse 20. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven, and the sight thereof, this is key, to all the earth. See, he was in control of the entire earth. Whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of heaven had their habitation. What's that mean? He was in control of the food as well. He didn't let anything go on in his kingdom that he wasn't aware of. Matter of fact, if you think back to Daniel chapter 1, he had his servants in charge of how and what kind of food Daniel would get and what kind of food the other kids were eating. This guy was in absolute authority. And guess what? The Antichrist in the end, he will be absolute authority. Don't think, and many people, I've, I've heard people, I'll just wait to get saved. And if the Antichrist comes, I'll just hide for seven years. Yeah, good, good luck with that. Good luck with that as you see the facial recognition scanners being put up at places, as 5G is getting ready to be enforced around the world, as all these different uh, so-called beast systems are being implemented. Hey, guess what? You better get saved because you're not going to hide. Verse 22. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reached unto heaven and thy dominion to the end of the earth. This guy's in absolute control. Now, hold your place here because I want to turn to Proverbs chapter 30 real quick. Proverbs 30. See, I believe the Apostle John just needed the book of Proverbs to tell you what a lion was like. Proverbs chapter number 30, verse number 30. And if you believe God, right, this is your book. Because God knows everything. Let me prove it to you. Verse 30. A lion which is the strongest among beasts. There. God said it. Do you believe it? Amen. Did you learn that from Encyclopedia Britannica? Or did you learn that from your King James Bible tonight? Oh, okay. And turneth not away for any. How many lions you see run from a fight? None. They run right into it. Another male lion comes within sight or scent. The male lion who's protecting his pride does not turn away. They'll run right at somebody who's fired at him multiple times and they still come. Why? Because he's the strongest among beasts. Hey, look, I don't care what animal you put up against it. I guarantee it doesn't want to fight with one that it can hear five miles away. Right? And it could probably knock a horse's head off with one swipe of its paw. And have you seen the neck on a horse? Yeah. Oh, but, you know, we, we got to go get an education. No, here's your education right here. A greyhound, a he-goat also, and a king. Hmm. Against whom there is no rising up. Well, it says it right there. There's coming some kings that you can't rise against. And I've heard people throughout the eons of time say, when the Antichrist comes, we're going to get guns and ammo, and we're going to fight against them. Oh, yeah, good luck. If that's what you're banking your eternity on. 
If thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, and this is the main part here, because I believe this applies to Nebuchadnezzar, because it is talking about a king. If thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, or if thou hast thought evil, uh uh-oh, lay thy hand upon thy mouth. Hmm. You know, it'd be good for the Antichrist to shut his mouth because one day God's going to shut it for him. Right? And you wonder why John said he saw a mouth like a lion? This guy came out of the earth running his, his mouth when John saw him. Just like a lion. You could hear it miles and miles away. Turn back to Daniel chapter number 4. Daniel chapter 4. Verse 23, And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High which has come upon my lord the king that they shall drive thee from men and they dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field or thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field and they shall make thee to eat grass as an oxen and sh- and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven and seven times shall pass over thee till thou know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and give it to whomsoever he will look the book of hosea says you've set up kings but not by me but let me tell you something god's still in control You can set up whatever king you want, but at the end of the day, God's going to move him or God's going to remove him. And that's how it usually goes down. And let me tell you something. You're going to see here what happens to Nebuchadnezzar to see if he learns his lesson. Verse 26, And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree, roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee. After that, thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. What is the lesson Nebuchadnezzar is going to learn? That God is going to take the kingdom from him, but he's going to give it back. Why? To show that God's in absolute control. Okay? Go on down. Now, here's the warning. And this is really important because we just read it in Proverbs, verse 31. Hey, Nebuchadnezzar, shut your mouth is what the Bible could have said, because verse 27 says, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thy iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Of thy tranquility. Now, I could take this ten different ways, too. I'll tell you why. Because the length of tranquility, that means peace, right? Right? to be tranquil, to have peace. Now, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways, then they'll have tranquility. Oh, wait, that's not what it says, but that's what it means. If we get right with God, just like if Nebuchadnezzar would have got right with God, there may have been a stay of his punishment, right? And that's what we need to keep in mind tonight, that the fight's not done for the Christian. Even though our numbers are few right now, we can still hold back the judgment of God. Well, how is that? By getting rid of the sin in our life. By pushing forward, serving God. By getting people saved. By occupying until he comes. That's what the Bible teaches from the beginning to the end. You can, you can get God's blessing back on your life. Deuteronomy 28, we're going to go there in a minute. The first 14 verses is God's blessings of obedience from verse number 15 to like verse 62. It's, this is what happens if you don't do what I say. I'd rather be in the first 14 verses. Now, does Nebuchadnezzar listen? No, because he's a lion with a big mouth. <clears throat> Verse number 29, at the end of the 12 months, he walked in the palace of the king, king, kingdom of Babylon. Verse 30, the king spake and said, is not this great Babylon? Here comes the problem that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. 
Hmm, sounds like a pretty big mouth for a ruler, right? Daniel just got, tell, got done telling him, hey, the interpretation of your dream is God sets up the kings. Just do what you're supposed to. Turn from your pride. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. That's another verse out of Proverbs. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou, until thou now that the Most High ruleth, in the kingdom of men. I think I need to upgrade my reading spectacles and give it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven. Now get this, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes into heaven, and my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. So what do we see? We see that he had eagle's feathers, and that his mind was restored, and a human heart was given back to him because he just spent seven years living like an animal, like an eagle in the field. So what does that mean? It means that Nebuchadnezzar is your third king. Not England, Nebuchadnezzar. America's not the eagle's wings, Nebuchadnezzar was. Now you say, well, but Brother Aaron, I don't understand. Does God really mess with the mind? And I'm going to just go on a short little run here, and I'm going to show you from the Bible where God does mess with the mind. Turn right in your Bible to Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter number one. Neat thing about the book of Habakkuk was that's the first book I read in reading the Bible cover to cover because of a, a track I read. Um, and this track had a guy going and meeting Habakkuk in heaven, and the guy stood before Habakkuk, and he said, oh, no, I'm sorry, I never read your book. And then it, was, it dawned on me, I never read Habakkuk either. And when I go to heaven, do I want to be accountable for never reading God's word cover to cover? And the answer is no. So it moved me to continue to read this book cover to cover. Something as simple as that, a Bible track. Now, verse number 8 of Habakkuk chapter 1. Well, let's go to verse 6. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans. That's the Babylonians. That's Nebuchadnezzar. That bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses are also swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. And they shall scoff at the kings and princes, shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. And it almost looks like Nebuchadnezzar's invincible, does it not? This guy's he's the greatest military of all time. But wait a minute, let's read verse 11. Then shall his mind change. Hmm. Wait, you think that means that right in the middle of battle, he's just going to stop and let everybody live and everything go back to normal? Oh, wait, I'm just conquering the whole entire world and I'm going to stop. No, his mind changes. When does it change? Well, we just read it in Daniel. How do you know that? And he shall pass over and offend. Who did he offend? God Almighty. That's who. How do you know that? Imputing this his power unto his God, little g. He offended God by blaspheming God. And I'll tell you right now, Christian, we need to be careful because there's a lot of ways to blasphemy God. You know, when you're watching television and that person throws out the GD or the JC and you continue to watch it, that's actually blasphemy. And we've allowed it to take control in America today. That's one of the Ten Commandments. 
Not to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For in the day that thou takest his name in vain, I will not hold him guiltless who taketh my name in vain. Think about it when you're watching your show. When somebody rules out these words, if it doesn't cut you to the heart, you've been desensitized. And maybe your mind is starting to change. Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. See, God, God can mess with the mind like he did with Nebuchadnezzar. And I believe that God is going to mess with the Antichrist mind in order for him to do what he's got to do to go up against him in the end. He's got to let this guy believe he can win. Deuteronomy chapter number 28, verse number 28. Deuteronomy 8, 28, or 28, 28. The Lord... The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. What did he do to Pharaoh? Hardened his heart. Who is the Lord that I should let Israel go? Who's going to have a mouth like a lion but a proud ruler who's just going to give himself all the credit? He's got blindness of heart. 29, and thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. Hey, what happens to the Antichrist at the end? He's thrown alive into the lake of fire. Alive into the lake of fire. He's the first person, him and the false prophet, that make it there. Everybody else gets about a 15-minute reprieve, I guess, as they stand before God, before they're tossed in there, as death and hell and the grave give up all the dead at the great white throne judgment. That's the only break they get from hell. And then they go into hell fire and the lake of fire, where the beast and the false prophet are. Turn to Job chapter 12. Job chapter 12. Hey, you, you got to protect your mind tonight. I'm just going to tell you right now, there's a conspiracy among the prophets of the world, and you better protect your mind. You better be careful, little eyes, what you see. You better be careful, little ears, what you hear. You better be careful, little hands and feet, where you go and what you touch. Job chapter 12. Verse number 10, In whose hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind? Doth not, thy, doth not the ear try words? And the mouth taste is mean, with the ancient is wisdom, and the length of days understanding. With him is wisdom and strength, he hath, he hath counsel and understanding. Behold, he breaketh down, and it cannot be built again. He shutteth up a man, and there can be no opening. Behold, he withholdeth the waters, and they dry up. Also he sendeth them out, and they overturn the earth. Verse 16, with him is strength and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. God's in control even of the deceiver. Even though the deceiver thinks he's in control, for this cause, God shall send a strong delusion. For this cause, because there are certain men crept in unawares. There are deceivers out there. Evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. First Chronicles, I believe God asked for a perverse spirit, somebody to lie. Verse 17, he leadeth counselors away spoiled and maketh the judges fools. He looseneth the bonds of the bond of, a king, of kings and girdeth their loins with a girdle. He leadeth princes away spoiled and overthroweth the mighty. He removeth away the speech of the trusty and taketh away the understanding of the aged. You know, only a hoary head be found. Uh, the hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. Listen, I'll tell you what, being down in and here in Florida, I, you know, I, I used to see a lot of older people that were really good Christian people, but now as the older generations passed and it's been uh, supplemented with some of the older people I see today, there's not so much a crown of glory. There really isn't. I see it. I, <clears throat> I can remember driving down the road where we live the first 10 years while we lived here and some of the really older people would wave they'd be in their driveway sitting on a chair waving at 
everyone that drove by. Now you can wave at people and they, huh? Huh? They don't even like you. And they just, they, ah, oh, it's, it's terrible. And the hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. And look, some of the, you know, that's why the older women and older men are to teach the younger. But see, God's taken away the understanding of the age. Why? Because they're spoiled. Because they're not listening. They're not repenting, turning to God. They're just living in their own whatever. He poureth contempt upon princes and weakeneth the strength of the mighty. He discovers deep, deep things out of darkness and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. He increaseth the nations and destroyeth them. He enlargeth the nations and straighteneth them again. He taketh away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth and causeth them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. They grope in the dark without light, and he maketh them to stagger like a drunken man. Nebuchadnezzar, if you would have just listened to Daniel as he read the book of Job to you, as he read Deuteronomy to you, hey, king, if you would have just listened who's really in charge, because he said it in verse number 27. He said it. He said, just turn, just get the sin out of your life. Just quit being so prideful. If you had just listened. And that's the lesson to all of us. But this mouth is coming out. One of the seven heads as he tries to control the world. And he's going to speak blasphemy against God. Claiming that he is God. As he sits in the temple of God. And he's going to set up his own statue like Nebuchadnezzar did. And he's going to make everybody worship it. And if they don't worship it, they're going to die. And people think it's a joke. That the Bible is a fairy tale. And it's a fantasy land. But this is history. And this is what happened. And this is the problem. We're not paying attention. Turn to Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28, that's how you know this is written by God, that you can go through the whole thing. You can see prophecy everywhere. You can see Jesus everywhere. You can see how you should live everywhere. Yep. It's everywhere. He wrote this book for you. Let's read it. Verse number 13, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesses and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Nebuchadnezzar, I know Daniel had the book of Proverbs. That's a pretty popular book. He at least had one of the scrolls or rolls or whatever, right? One of the parchments. Maybe he had that verse memorized. You can memorize a lot of verses if you read them a lot and practice. You'd be surprised what you can do. Verse 14, happy is the man that feareth always, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. Nebuchadnezzar, do one thing. Don't be like Pharaoh. Oh, wait, but you just did in Daniel. So you're going to fall into mischief. Verse 15, as a roaring lion and a raging bear, so is the wicked ruler over the poor people. <laughs> I don't, I don't even have to preach that. Verse 16, the prince that wanteth understanding is also a great oppressor, but he that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. Guess what? There's coming another beast. He's the leopard, and he coveted. Alexander coveted the kingdom of the Medo-Persians. I could show you all four of these in this one passage I'm going to read. A man that doth violence to the blood of any person shall flee to the pit. Let no man stay him. Whoso walketh uprightly shall be saved. But he that is perverse in his ways shall fall at once. He that filleth his land shall have plenty of bread. But he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. To have respect of persons is not good. For a piece of bread, that man will transgress. And I kind of threw this together because here's the thing. If you look at that last verse, for a piece of bread, people will rat out their loved ones when there's no food around. 
After seven days, people turn to cannibalism. <gasps> you can't, we've had it so good in America. Yeah, we're just like Judges chapter two. God brought us into the promised land of America and we've forsaken him. Don't think God won't bring trouble to America to get us back to him. Don't think for a New York minute that God is just all, but don't, uh, don't mistake God's uh, grace for the lack of judgment that he's given to America right now. Don't just think that he's just going to be so graceful all the way to the very end because throughout the entire Bible, he's judged multiple nations to try to bring them back to him. Amen. We need to be real careful, America. We need to be really careful tonight. <clears throat> I don't want to get into the next point yet, but what I am going to say is, is that there is, I believe, a food shortage that can be coming. We're starting to see it now because many of the meatpacking plants up north have shut down. They're already predicting a 20% shortage in food. And I'm just finally glad they put toilet paper back on the shelf because that was starting to really make me nervous. You know, I've prepped a lot of things in my life, but one of them I never thought of was toilet paper. That's a new one. So I've really got to think that one through. I think we all do. Or install a bidet in our house. One or the other, right? But let me tell you something right now. This Antichrist has all the characteristics of every nasty world leader that's lived. He's going to be the worst nightmare rolled into one. And his worst quality you can read it in Revelation chapter 13 again. He has a mouth speaking blasphemy. He goes on and, and, and he causes the whole world to be deceived. Read chapter 13. It just lays it right out there. And he's going to cause everybody to worship him just like Nebuchadnezzar did. Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, when you hear the music, you better bow to the statue. And there were three guys who didn't. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why? Because they cared less what the king said. They cared less. Even though he roared like a lion, he wasn't the lion. Those guys went into the fire and they met the lion, the son of God. And Jesus, to us who are saved, when we see Jesus Christ, we're going to see a lamb slain from the foundations of the world, those who are saved. When we die or are raptured out of here, we're going to be in the presence of the Lord and we're going to see Jesus Christ with his hands open. And we're going to see the wounds not scars, wounds. Why? Because that blood is pouring over the mercy seat as we speak. We're going to see the holes in his feet where the spikes went through. We're going to see a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We're lucky. But see, those people who dwell on the earth, who love not the truth that they might be saved, whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, guess what they get to see? They get to go from a lion's mouth to meeting the lion of the tribe of Judah. And there's going, to be no found, there's going to be no place found for them. It's important you win your family to Christ now. It's important that you fast, pray, do business with God, wrestle with God. Be like the widow because of her much speaking, God had to save them so you'd leave them alone and get on to something else. Do what you got to do. Because I can tell you right now, the last thing I'd want to be is face to face with a real lion. Face to face with a real lion. See, the Bible says the wrath of the lamb. The wrath of the lamb is come. So when the wrath of the lamb comes, you're going to see a lion if you're not saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for everything you've given us. We thank you for your word. Lord, I ask that you would just be with our many members tonight, Lord, and those who are unable to attend. Lord, and those who have concerns or maybe they don't want to get anybody else sick if they believe they've been around others that, that may be ill. Lord, I just ask that uh, you be with them and you would meet with them tonight. Lord, I think of uh, Sister Cindy as, as uh, Brother Weaver has gone on to be with you and as he's become part of that great cloud of witnesses. He had a great salvation testimony. What a, what a good guy. What a hard worker in his life. Lord, I just ask that you would strengthen her. Lord, I think of all those that have lost loved ones in the past couple years at Berean Baptist Church. 
Lord, I think of them and I think of how they've, they've hurt and they've been alone. Lord, meet with each one of them. Lord, just, just let them know you're there. Let them know that you care and you love them. And Lord, help each one of us to just be able to remember what afflictions and trouble they go through and to think about them. And as their, as their faces pop into our mind throughout a regular day that we pray for them, that we lift them up in prayer, that we exhort one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. There's a lot more to going to church than just sitting here. We need to bear each other's burdens and all of our imperfections because we all have them. Lord, help each one of us tonight to draw closer to you, not with our mouth, but with our heart. Lord, help us to, to realize what's really important we can get excited and, and in a tiff when we see things leading in the direction that your return could be right around the corner. But Lord, help us to, to, to focus on others first. Lord, I know that there are many out there tonight that maybe they, they get nervous and they, they hoard up possessions and things because they believe that bad times are coming. But you know what? God's going to see each one of his people through it because the Bible says he's never seen his seed forsaken, nor the righteous begging bread. Lord, help us to store up the true treasure, and that's people. Help us to go after human beings to win them to Christ. Help us to go back after people to bring them back to you if they are saved that their life would be yeah. joyful and that they wouldn't have the fear that the world is, is just bombarding them with. Lord, help us to be receptive to others and their feelings. Mm -hmm. I know that's something I struggle with. I get caught up in daily life. It seems like there's not enough time in a day. Lord, just strike my heart with mercy that I would think of others more often than myself. And Lord, I just ask that you would just strengthen our church, that it would be a place where it would be known that, that we bear each other's burdens and we help each other like true yoke fellow, and that we need each other to survive. Lord, I now ask then pray a pro protective hedge around our church and its members. Lord, I ask that you would just meet with each one of them individually in their heart and that you would protect them physically from the world. Lord, I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.